defense attorneys in Colorado want to know if their clients were wrongfully convicted in the hundreds of cases where the CBI says it, its analysts manipulated evidence. Crime and justice reporter Kelly Rinke spoke with one attorney who is frustrated with a lack of information coming from this investigation. This is that star witness that comes in and says absolutely that defendant is guilty. Missy Woods was considered the gold standard, a 29 year veteran at CBI's crime lab. Prosecutors used her DNA analysis in hundreds of cases to put people behind bars. There's been uh, an outpouring actually of folks calling me saying, hey, Missy w Woods worked on my case. What can you do to help? Defense attorney Casey Crisman says several people called him over the weekend after CBI released its findings in an internal affairs investigation. The report said Woods manipulated data impacting more than 650 cases. You don't have any idea if your client's cases are a part of that review. No, we're punching in the dark here. Uh, we know that 652 at least, and that number is likely to grow. And all I know is that I've done the legwork to try to find my clients who might have been affected. Chrisman dug through his cases and found three clients who pleaded guilty based on DNA evidence by Missy Woods. He still doesn't know if they're included on CBI's list. It's clear that names need to be released, cases need to be released to the to the individuals who it matters to the most. The Office of the State Public Defender feels the same way. They released a statement saying in part, the lack of transparency is extremely concerning. People are spending time in custody right now. People People are losing their liberty right now. People are not able to get jobs or housing right now. Attorneys who represent the defendants question if anyone has been wrongfully convicted. Woods' attorney says she's never given false testimony that's resulted in a false conviction. How many cases could be reopened? How many lives have been lost? How many mothers have been crying unnecessarily at night? CBI says the investigation didn't find Woods falsifying DNA matches. Rather, she cut corners by deleting and altering data. We did request a copy of that internal affairs report. CBI denied our request, citing an ongoing criminal investigation, Alex. Yeah, it's interesting to see this attorney being so proactive, but I mean, there's only so much he can do and we don't know what cases are specifically affected. And because he doesn't have that information, he's kind of waiting to see if, uh, you know, he, he can file an appeal. He's preparing for that, but he wants to learn a little bit more before he makes that decision. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to grasp what the fallout of this is going to be. 652 yeah, we'll cases. Well, we're glad you're on it. Thanks. Fort Collins police are asking for help finding a man accused of shooting and killing someone over the weekend happened late Saturday night at an apartment complex on Mangold Lane, not far from College and Vine. Inside, police found a man dead with a gunshot wound. Investigators say they're looking for a 31-year-old named Adrian Pacheco. It's a warrant for first-degree murder. Police are familiar with this guy. He's got a current case against him, felony charges, including assault, child abuse, theft. He's pleaded not guilty on those charges. Police say Pacheco may be armed. If you see him, you're asked to call 911. It's a beautiful sunny day and it's a calm, dry evening and you can enjoy this while it lasts because later this week, Denver could see quite a bit of snow. We're getting used to this, Kathy, in March, but um, I mean, this could be some serious snow. Yeah, the average snowfall in March, Alex, is about 11.2 inches and this one storm could deliver that total to Denver if the models are correct and stay on track with the storm that's coming in on Wednesday. Hard to believe when you have a day with highs in the 60s and 70s. Temperatures this hour are still in the 40s beautiful out there. We've got a mild night tonight, a great day tomorrow, but this major storm heads in Wednesday night into Thursday with the potential impact for heavy snow, not just in the high country, but right here in Denver. No advisories for snow for Denver, but in the mountains, a winter storm watch will go out for one to two feet of snow on Thursday. A winter weather advisory starts tomorrow for up to a foot of snow across the western slope and southern mountains. We have a brief shower tonight, a little bit of snow in the high country tomorrow, but it's really Really Wednesday when we see the rain showers develop, changing over to all snow Wednesday night and becoming heavy through that drive time on Thursday morning. A closer look, an in-depth look at the amounts, the totals and the timing coming up in just a bit. Kathy, thank you. The Denver Fire Department says one person is in the hospital tonight after a home explosion. This happened this afternoon near Alameda and Sheridan in the Westwood neighborhood. Denver Fire says when they arrived, the fire wasn't that big, but they had to be careful putting it out because the structure could have collapsed. One person was taken to the hospital. We're not sure how they're doing tonight. We do you know the family that lives there could not stay in the home anymore because it's simply not safe. Denver Fire says a corroded gas line caused the explosion.
Tonight, the fight for one residence or residents of, of one Denver mobile home park it, to own the land they live on took a big step forward. Nine News reporter Rachel Kraus explains how they plan to protect their homes now and for years to come. Venga, mijo. For the past two decades, Venga. the capital city Venga. Monte Vista mobile home park has been home Venga. for Jorge Alberto Loya and his family. Esta mi esposa también. Creo que puede... He loves everything about this place. Todo, todo, todo. Estoy muy a gusto aquí. Estoy contento con mi familia. When the park was put up for sale two years ago, he and his neighbors, like Eduardo Castaneda, Nuestra comunidad worried they'd be forced to leave their homes. Eh, definitivamente desplazado por una situación que podíamos eh, trabajarlo y hacerlo patente para que nuestra comunidad fuera los dueños de este terreno. Thanks to some help from Justice from the People Legal Center, residents took action to become the new park owners themselves. Mobile homes are zone non-conforming. Stephanie Fox was sharing connection. The organization helping to buy the park for the residents says they've been working to get together the $11.5 million they'll need. Pretty much, yeah. On Monday, the Denver City Council approved a $2.6 million loan to help. And the end goal for us and for the residents is to then we transfer the ownership over to them at zero profit. After nearly two years of work, the sale of the mobile home park is nearly complete. A ver cómo se dan las cosas. For Jorge, it's a relief knowing he and his neighbors will soon truly own the place they call home. Yo como quiera, pero yo siempre he luchado por ellos y quiero que sigan yendo las escuelas de aquí. Y mi hija está estudiando también para maestra aquí, y entonces quiero que, que sigan aquí. His kids are proud of their dad. Because we didn't really want to move out of here. And the work he and others here have done to ensure this will stay their home. Thank you. We're proud of him. <laughs> the sale of the mobile home park is expected to close at the end of the month. Then residents will get to decide how they want to move forward, whether that's a community land trust or a co-op. And both residents and their community partners say they hope what they're doing here can really be an example and show other mobile home park residents that they can become owners as well. It's been fascinating to see over the last couple of years from southwest Colorado to northern Colorado, now right here in the city, so many people trying to take ownership quite literally. Absolutely, and with affordable housing so in need, something like this can really be a game changer for folks. Rachel Krauss, thank you. State Senate committee has approved a bill to ban the term excited delirium on death certificates and police reports in Colorado. That legislation follows a nine news investigation. Our team found that the term excited delirium was linked to more than 225 deaths nationwide, including the death of Elijah McLean. A number of medical organizations have debunked the term. It's not a real medical condition. It's often used to justify excessive force by law enforcement. The Senate Judiciary Committee passed that bill earlier today, now goes to the full Senate. Another bill is going before the state legislature after our investigative team looked into a series of deaths. It all happened when people were restrained by police. Investigative reporter Chris Vanderveen did his first story on prone restraint in 2020. Tonight, he has the follow-up from the state capitol. When their faces fail to tell their story, okay, wait a minute. Okay, I'll get on the their voices okay, succeed. Man, I can't breathe my face. Face down, often handcuffed, often under the knees, elbows, and full weight of officers attempting to arrest them. Our investigation identified more than 130 deaths following what's known as prone or face down restraint. It's exceptionally dangerous, and as your own reporting has shown, leads to too many deaths. State Representative Stephen Woodrow watched our investigation. Thank you for your work on this, because it's a big reason why we're here. Here to discuss legislation he's co-sponsoring with State Representative Leslie Herod that would effectively ban prolonged prone restraint in the state of Colorado. We're not saying you can't use prone restraint at all, but we are saying that once you have someone subdued and controlled that you are able then, that you must lift them back up so that they can breathe. That. Get off him. Get him on his side. Get him upright. That um, is precisely what nationally recognized uh, police uh, trainer yeah. Jack Ryan told us more than three years ago. As I've said in training, at times that we ought to have that printed on the dashboard of the police car or maybe tattooed to the back of everybody's hand. Get off them and get them into a position that facilitates breathing. It's something the U.S. Department of Justice recommended nearly three decades ago. As soon as the suspect is handcuffed, get him off his stomach. Why? To help minimize the risk of sudden in-custody death. And when someone is kept in a prone position, 
with their hands handcuffed behind their back, face down, they're no longer the threat. As our investigation found, even as knowledge of the risk grows, mistakes still happen. In late 2022, for example, deputies in Adams County placed a handcuffed Arthur Royball face down into a gurney and kept him there for 16 minutes before he stopped breathing. Here's the truth. The majority of law enforcement officers follow the training. The vast majority follow the training. It's the times when they don't that we see unfortunate and deadly outcomes. California and Nevada have passed similar prone restraint bans. After our investigation, the cities of Minneapolis and Denver changed how they train their officers. The Colorado ban will be open for debate inside the state capitol in the coming weeks. Chris Vanderveen, 9 News. The bill applies not just to officers in the field, but to officers and staff working inside jails. The state has already banned prone restraint inside of schools and the state mental health hospital.